Flips it to the end zone. Caught. Touchdown. Marvin Harrison Jr. making a huge impact. Here's Edwards with the lay. Donovan Edwards down the sideline. Catch pass ransom. Donovan Edwards. Touchdown, Michigan. This is the CFF Sites Week 9 podcast. My name is Joe DeSalvo, the voice of the CFF site. And here we are just a week or two away from the college fantasy football playoffs. If you play in a head to head format, if your format does incorporate a quarter final round, this indeed is the final week of your regular season weeks, 11, 12, 13 will be dedicated to the playoffs. And if you play in a league that has a semifinal round where the top four are the only ones that advance. You've only got two weeks left uh, for a lot of you guys out there. So you're either looking to to pad your seating at this point. You're looking to make a run to qualify for the playoffs. Um, and maybe for some holding on to a spot. I mean, for others, maybe in keeper leagues, you've, you've moved on. Maybe you're looking for some players to grab off the waiver wire. And so we're going to cover a little bit of everything this week. We are going to start like I have been over the last couple of weeks where we're going to start about the college uh, just discuss the college football playoffs and the teams that are that are alive uh, from my you know perspective of of who's in it to win it. We're gonna look at the Heisman race, touch on that really quickly, uh, just because you know all of the guys in the Heisman race are fantasy assets that can be very um, instrumental to your playoff run here down the stretch. gonna throw out a few streaming defenses for you guys in full FBS and maybe power five leagues as well. If you stream defenses, I've got about six options for you this week. If maybe they're available on the waiver wire and as always I'm going to jump into some, some discord questions, questions from the discord community. Um, I thought last week's show would be a lot shorter than what it was. um, But you know, this one, I may hold true to my word on this. It seems like the questions uh, have gotten um, not as many of them coming in this week on Discord. And, you know, it's interesting because this is the time of the year where traditionally, and and this is the reason why I want to talk college football playoff and Heisman as well. Um, you know, end of the year, if you play in non-keeper formats, uh, there are some fantasy owners that have probably become a little disengaged, um, you know, and unfortunately it doesn't, do the integrity of the league any favors um, or it doesn't do any favors to the, to the integrity of the league by them sort of abandoning teams. But we just know by the history of the CFF site clicks, uh, those that watch the show uh, get fewer and fewer viewers, listeners and clicks on the site as we get into the later weeks of the season. And, you know, that's to be expected um, you know, once when your team is out of the college fantasy football playoffs, you know, some guys then turn their attention to just college football, turn attention to maybe their NFL fantasy team. So look, uh, no offense taken. It's just the nature of the beast. I get it. That's the, that's the industry we in. We start early college fantasy football. Look, we get two games in the books before NFL even kicks off their, their week one. Uh, but at the same time, that means that the college fantasy football season wraps up much earlier than the NFL fantasy as uh, fantasy season as well. And so that's just the nature of the beast. So we're going to try to keep this conversation going with this podcast throughout the rest of the season to incorporate a little bit more than just college fantasy football. Um, but, you know, I, you know, when we get to that point, I, f- I have a couple of topics, uh, players, maybe uh, mainly, you know, players like Ashton Genty, the Minnesota backfield, uh, mainly uh, Braylon Allen as well with Wisconsin. I have some thoughts on those guys with, uh, you know, what some recent happenings in regards to injury, um, you know, DNPs. So I'm going to add that on to the question port portion of the show and just start again. Uh, you know, let's start with the Heisman because I think that one's pretty, I think, of all of them, that might be the the easiest conversation right now. Uh, in my book, I've got Jaden Daniels one, Jordan Travis two, and then I still think right now between Penix, Gabriel, Williams, Knicks, I, you know, I know those two losses by USC didn't do any favors, but uh, didn't do Williams any favors on his chances to repeat, and I don't think that he will, but I don't think those two goose eggs by Penix in two of the last four weeks did him any favors, but, you know, you just kind of have the feeling that 
you know, you knew Michael Penix, if he threw four touchdowns, there's going to be some hype to try to him, try to get him back in the conversation as long as Washington stays undefeated. I just don't think he's a Heisman caliber quarterback. Um, and look, I said this earlier, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and, and I'll say it again, particularly when we get to just sort of the college football play playoff race and the, and, you know, just the, you know, the lay of the land and, and taking a snapshot of the landscape of that. Uh, I thought Oklahoma and Texas were, were a couple of my overvalued teams. Uh, I think Oklahoma losing did do a little bit of a dent to Dylan Gabriel, but I still think that, that he's in it. Oklahoma is still in it. Uh, and he was good. He was good against Kansas. Uh, but for me, and you know, for me, I think Jordan Travis is going to be in it unless Florida state should really just kind of, you know, fold the, fold the table, fold the tent. Uh, because look, I was wrong about UNC. I thought they would be nine and zero going into the last three games of the year. And, um, They've lost the first two games since I've said that. So I think Drake May is probably eliminated from the Heisman conversation. But right now I've got Daniels one, Jordan Travis two. And I just think Penix Gabriel probably close three, four. And I think Williams is sitting five, even though I think Williams is the superior talent. I would have Williams actually third in mind just because I just think he's that good of a talent. And I think you've got to include Bo Nix in there. Oregon still in the running and so I think Nick still has to be in that conversation. So for me, I think that, you know, it comes down to those six names right now. Uh, I don't know if I'm missing any. I know I had thrown out maybe McCarthy and Corm at Michigan. I just don't think that, you know, they're they're really playing enough to, to get those big numbers. And I think that's what the Heisman comes down to right now is those six teams. So let's – and look, here we go. Jaden Daniels has a game against Alabama this week, and so uh, let's see how he performs in that game. Remember, you know, it's unfortunate that we we put a lot of weight in the win-losses uh, when it comes to the Heisman Trophy, but, uh, you know, Jaden Daniels cannot control how bad the LSU defense can be. He can only control what he can control, and that is the LSU offense, and he has looked spectacular, and his numbers have been just every bit as good of – as uh well he he has been every bit as good of what his numbers have looked which i can't say of that about some of the top quarterbacks in the nation maybe for guys like Penix, who i feel at times maybe just padded stats against the right opponent so we'll see but that's the heisman thoughts here's where i'm at it for college football playoff and really for me i think it's really quite simple right now if things hold as is in no particular order, or I'll go in order. I think you've got to look at Michigan one, Georgia two. I think you've got to look at Florida State at three. Maybe Florida State and Georgia are interchangeable at two or three. Does it really matter at two or three or play in one another? And then four for me right now is Ohio State. Now, things are going to happen between now and then because Michigan is going to play Ohio State. And depending on what happens, I do think we could get a scenario because those guys are in the same division where we could see a scenario unfolding much like we did last year where both of those teams make it. Now, there are some things that have to happen. I've been saying for a couple of weeks that Oklahoma was playing with fire with Cincinnati and with Central Florida. Well, they finally got tripped up against Kansas. Texas was basically taken to the wire by Houston, who just got obliterated by Kansas State right now. So even though Oklahoma and Texas are both sitting at 7-1 and one right now and sitting at 4-1 and one atop the Big 12, I happen to think that Kansas State right now is the best team in the Big 12. They still play Texas. They have that matchup coming up this week. So I think that question will hopefully get answered for us. And even though I think Kansas State is the best team in the Big 12, Oklahoma State may be the one team in that conference that no one wants to play right now, and Oklahoma still has to play Oklahoma State. Kansas State is sitting there with six and two at a six and two six and two record. If they run the table, I think basically what you're looking at is Big 12's eliminated because they're just going to cannibalize one another. But that's the way that I feel right now. I you know even though Texas has that big win earlier in the year at Alabama, they lost the late game. Uh, you know, lost in the final seconds to Oklahoma. Oklahoma lost to Kansas. Can Oklahoma still has to play Oklahoma State. Texas still has to play Kansas State. I think Kansas State's the best team in the Big 12. And like I said, I'll echo the sentiment that Oklahoma State, I think, is the one team in that conference that no one wants to play right now. Ollie Gordon looks absolutely spectacular as that running back one right now for the Cowboys. 
Um, a matter of fact, I think he's averaged over 200 scrimmage yards per game in maybe the last four games combined, four or five games combined. He's just absolutely amazing for you guys that have him as you head down the stretch in your fantasy leagues. Um, when we look at the Pac-12, same thing. Washington sitting at the top eight and zero. Oh, you know, Oregon sitting there as well at seven and one. Could we get a rematch? You know, they're four and one in the conference. That's possibility, and maybe that rematch ends up being a playoff game to see who's in, who's out, or it could just be a game where, like I said, they cannibalize one another. U.S. You know, I have a thought on USC, even though they've lost two games. I'm going to save that thought for last because. I have a special piece on spoilers coming up. So when I really look at the teams, I think that are in major contention right now, like I said, I've got Michigan, Georgia, Florida state, OSU, I think as really the four teams right now that have kind of separated themselves at the top. I think you still have to, if there's one outside team on the second tier list, it might be Louisville um, just because they're seven and one overall four and one in the ACC. Maybe they've taken the place of what I thought about UNC a couple of weeks ago, but I don't think that they'll be there in the end of it, but I think they're the one team, um, the, the, the last tier two team that I have that I, that I believe has an outside shot. Oklahoma, Texas still has that shot. They're in the tier two Penn state still has an outside shot tier two. I'm just not impressed with their offense. I don't think in any scenario that Penn state, Unless they beat Michigan, I just don't see that happening. I just don't know if they have enough offensively to really keep up. Oregon's got that outside. I, I still think Oregon's t- uh, tier two. Washington, of course, undefeated is still tier two. And I think right now you still have to include Alabama and Ole Miss. Both of those teams right now sitting with an overall record of seven and one have to be in that tier two conversation, even though I don't think either of those teams are going to get in the college football playoffs. Now, Here's where it gets fun because there are there are definitely some spoiler teams in this thing. And I already mentioned Kansas State and Oklahoma State because I feel like they could really just spoil the Big 12's chances that if something wonky kind of happens um, and none of those teams are going to end up making the, the college football playoffs and they'll just cannibalize one another. The two other teams that I think are going to be really fun to follow over the next few weeks are going to be USC and LSU. And here's why I say that. USD, I believe, still has Washington and Oregon on their Pac-12 schedule. And while I believe that the Huskies and the Ducks are both better than the Trojans, they are playing Caleb Williams. And I don't care how bad USC's defense is, as long as they have Caleb Williams and that offense is okay and healthy and clicking, they're still going to have an outside shot to outscore Washington or Oregon in any type of a matchup. Not saying that it will happen. But when you've got Caleb Williams, they have a shot to make that happen. And I think USC, even though they're eliminated from the college football playoff conversation, can make things really interesting in the Pac-12 because they do get Washington and Oregon upcoming. I, look, Utah's no longer in that conversation, but they were the one team that I thought no one went, really wanted to play in the Pac-12. But Oregon demolished them this past weekend, and it really did show that defense was not enough to re- at some point you're going to have to score. And that's where you, you at Utah just really got tripped up. That's why I think when you look in the college football playoff landscape of things, that's why I think eventually Penn state's not going to have enough to get there. Eventually their defense is going to have a bad game. They're going to have to score some points and really that second loss to Michigan, it, you know, if they lose that second game uh, at the expense of Michigan, then they're, you know, going to be eliminated from contention. And then the other spoiler for me is LSU. And I just think that because of their offense, uh, same thing, you know, same thing, just same conversation, very similar to that of USC. LSU's defense has not been that good, but their offense has been good enough to score about anybody outside that first game of the year when it just looked like they weren't ready to play. um, I think if they played Florida State over again, they'd probably score four touchdowns. Uh, now, that, not to say that they wouldn't give up five and they wouldn't lose that game again, but I do think that they would be a different team offensively. The reason why I think LSU is still a spoiler is they get Alabama, obviously, this weekend. So we'll find out how serious of a spoiler LSU can be in this. They may be they they may continue their spoiler run for the SEC this week, or it could come to an end. If they beat Alabama this weekend, there's still a shot for them to make the SEC title game, which 
then could they could play spoiler again and go up against Georgia. Ole Miss right now still has maybe the inside track. If I don't know, maybe if LSU trips up Alabama this weekend, you'd be looking at a, a three-way tie atop of that. I don't, I'm not sure what's going to shake out in the SEC. But LSU right now is the one team and USC, along with Kansas State and Oklahoma State. Those, those teams can play spoilers in the SEC Pac-12 and the Big 12. And it'll be interesting to see if it comes down to it, if the four teams that I mentioned who are kind of in the catbird seat, I think right now, if they make it. The only one that I think has potential to really get bumped out of that would be Ohio State. I don't know if they're going to have enough to beat Michigan because, like I said, I do I, I, I like Ohio State, but I don't think their offense is as good as it has been in past years. However, when you compare Penn State to Ohio State, I just think Ohio State, the fact that Henderson's coming back healthy, if he's healthy and they've got Marvin Harrison Jr., you do have a difference maker in that offense or one or two of them that can make a difference in a big matchup in a game against Michigan. But I have my concerns. Michigan beats them by two or three touchdowns. Um, then we may see Ohio State eliminated out of the playoff race, and we'll see who gets that fourth spot. But you know, that's under the assumption Florida State, Georgia, and Michigan are run the going to run the table, and we have a long way to go but at least those are my thoughts through the first nine weeks of the regular season on on where we're sitting right now in regards to the college football playoffs and regards and in regards to the Heisman Trophy race now moving into college fantasy football week 10 very important a lot of you guys out there I know streaming defenses you just don't have one of the top defenses on a week-to-week basis, and streaming is big for you. You like to get a few names early in the week. Here's six that I have for you. They may or may not be available. And like I said, this is always tough to do because I never know the format of leagues. I never know how deep your leagues are. So I'd like to have at least a couple in the um, it, for G5 and a couple for Power 5 if I can. So here we go. Let's start in the group of five. I think Sam Houston State is an intriguing defensive option this week against Kennesaw State and FCS program. I think Tulane this week, if available, is remember they just played Rice, so they may be floating around. I don't know if anyone would have started them um, against Rice or not. Maybe they're available going on the road at East Carolina. I don't think East Carolina is very good at all, even though they scored quite a few points this past week. I think Tulane manhandles them at East Carolina. Those are my two G5 teams that I would consider. I've got four power five teams. I don't know if any of these are available in your league, but these are kind of the teams I would look at assuming these are the type of teams that would be available. I think you've got to look at Tennessee hosting UConn, Um, you know, Tennessee SEC team going, you know, hosting, hosting a G5 team. I think you've got to look at that matchup this week. Nebraska's defense has been very good. Their offense has still been rather below average, but their defense has been really, really solid. They go on the road as well this week. They go to Michigan State. Um, but I think that Nebraska defense is solid enough that if you need a streaming defense, I like what they're doing. They scored on a special teams touchdown this past week on a block kick. I think you've got to consider them. North Carolina coming off of that lot coming off of back-to-back losses has a chance maybe to get right against an FCS program in Campbell. I still think Campbell's going to find a way to score some points, but maybe you can get that defense to score for you on the North Carolina side. And the one, you know, here, here's the thing. I kind of like teams, you know, um, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago when Stanford scored all those points and, and um, uh, came back and beat Colorado. And then the following week I said, Hey, I really loved UCLA. That was a defense I liked. You say UCLA panned out very well for that. Well, here's the deal. Um, you know, Duke is coming off, I think, what, maybe like a 23, 24 nothing loss at Louisville this past week. But I believe they get Wake Forest at home. And if Duke is out there available, I think you've got to look at them this week in that matchup against Wake Forest. So those are the six I would look at. Duke, UNC, Nebraska, Tennessee, Sam, Houston State, and Tulane. So those are my stream of defenses for the week. Now, with that being said, we are going to get into 
the Discord questions. But before we get into the Discord questions, I just want to address something real quick because this we're getting to the point of the season where injuries matter. And knowing that your player is going to play 100% definitely matters. We're at the point where 50-50, unless you have some type of a subsystem, is not going to cut it. Taking chances on players, it, it's just not going to work. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is there's a lot of frustration right now, particularly, and, and there's there's a few names I'm going to bring up, uh, but, but Washington receiver Jalen McMillan, where we've gotten word that he was going to be playing or ready to play like seems like for like three straight weeks now, it's just not happening. And I don't think even though you might be playing for your playoff life this coming week, unless you have some type of an auto subsystem, I don't even know if I would risk playing him just in the chance that he plays six snaps and doesn't play anymore. When it comes to guys like that, I don't know if you can really put and stake your playoff life on taking a chance on those guys that just aren't playing right now, right? You've got that going on with uh, Emeka Ibuka right now at Ohio State. Darius Taylor was a you know a, a, a game day scratch for Minnesota after he played the previous week. Like these are guys now that I don't trust that they're going to be ready to go this week, even if we get word that they're ready because we just don't know. We just haven't seen them play. And then you go where, then you take a look at Boise State where George Halani's industry I- injury a few weeks ago basically thrusts Aston Genty into that overall running back one spot for college fantasy football. Well, this past weekend, Aston Genty, you know, he gets injured. So I think now, one, those who have Genty are going to get burned a little bit now if he can't play moving forward for a couple of weeks. And you've got to go out there and try to get George Helani, or if you're sitting out there with George Helani, you're in a situation where you've got a must-start player. Now, I don't think that Helani is going to be able to produce the numbers in an exclusive running back one role that Genty did, but as a running back one in that offense, I still think he's going to be a must-start if Ashton Genty is out. The Minnesota backfield, like, I don't even know what we do from this point forward right now until we get absolute 100% clarity, and there's not a lot that we can do about that right now. Darius Taylor was looking like the clear-cut running back one. He gets injured, misses a couple of games, comes back, and then we find out that he's back this past week. He and Zach Evans were both out, and all of a sudden, Jordan Newbin carries the ball 40 times for 204 yards and two touchdowns. Now, they get Illinois this week. So now what happens if Taylor's healthy? Do you just shelve Newbin, who just went 42-04 and two? You know, I don't know. That's it, It's a really big dilemma for you guys out there that have Darius Taylor. I'm curious if any of you all that have him are going out, out on the waiver wire or scoop up Jordan Newbin as well. Uh, I think you may, just out of safety reasons. But I'm kind of curious to see if we get any hint of Taylor playing this weekend. Because if we do, I actually think that does you guys a lot worse than knowing that he's out. Because um, who knows what's going to happen in that situation. And you are really taking a chance this week if you start anybody from that Minnesota backfield, unless there's a hundred percent clarity that somebody's going to be a workhorse back. And I don't think we're going to get that until we see it. And then you've got the injury of Braylon Allen, right? And so where does he stand? You know, Ches Malisi went down a few weeks ago, Braylon Allen, Allen gets running back one status all to himself. And all of a sudden he goes down. Um, is he going to be out? When will he come back? And so now you own us with Braylon Allen's or uh, Braylon Allen had kind of left, you know, um, left out to dry right now as well. So this is where you really have to hit the waiver wire. You've really got to start building that roster depth. And we're getting into the weeks where you can't take a chance on starting a guy that may not play just for the sake that he may come back and start because the coach says that they're ready to play. Like, look, we've we've projected Jalen McMillan in the in the projections, right? How could we not when we get we're gonna get word that McMillan is back this week, right? That you know, that was the word, but then we don't get anything from him. So it hurts in the projections. And then I know some of you guys see the projections, like, yeah, I've got to get him in there. Um, 
sometimes the projections are based on the assumption that the guys are going to play. We never really can assume that a player is going to be a, a game day scratch when we're getting news that he's going to be playing that weekend. So just keep tuned in. I cannot tell you how important it is to really tune into that Discord injury channel this time of the year on Saturday mornings, probably between 9.30 a.m. or, or 10.30 a.m. and 12 noon Eastern. You want to be wired into the injury channel of the Discord. I cannot tell you there's probably not a better place to be on a Saturday morning if you're ready to set your lineups than in the CFF site's Discord, paying attention to all the news and notes that are coming in from around the country. You know, the the, the Discord members crowdsourcing and, and us putting stuff in there about injuries that could affect how you build your rosters going into this weekend and in future weeks. So look, if you've got a Heisman or an all American membership and you still have not gone into the discord, you've got to get in there. You've got to get in. It's the place to be for that 90 minutes leading up to that 12 PM kickoff hour in on the Saturday on Saturday afternoon. Let's get into now the discord questions for this week. And so let's, uh, Let's get into it. Here we go. Jaeger 74 for the pod this week. Silas Bolden for Oregon State versus Colorado or Tet McMillan, Arizona versus UCLA. Matchup play versus talent play, he says. Here's my thoughts. Silas Bolden has caught a touchdown in three of his last four. McMillan has at least six receptions in six of his last seven games, they play UCLA. I think if you were more in a PPR format, full point PPR, you'd have to give McMillan some serious consideration because you know he's probably going to get six catches. But I think from a matchup standpoint, I'd probably go with Silas Bolden, Bolden in that matchup for Oregon State at Colorado. Now, what's interesting is that I put this in my news and notes how Damian Martinez, the running back for Oregon State, only has three rushing touchdowns through eight games. Remember at the beginning of the season, my concern with him was that he was going to be a 12, 1400 yard rusher and not score double digit touchdowns. He's on pace for that. He's on pace for about 1150 rushing yards right now. He's only scored three touchdowns in eight games, which means he's only on pace to score four for the year. Now, I think he's going to find the end zone more than one time in these last four games for his fantasy owners, but it looks like the projection that we made based on Oregon state's first two games of the year and the way that they were looking in the red zone that, and, and with DJ, you being there at quarterback, that, that forecast may actually play out, but I think he has a big game next week as well. And I think you've got to get him in the lineup. So Oregon state players are definitely going to be a matchup. You're going to want to target this upcoming week with that game on the road at Colorado. Now, here's the other thing we have to pay attention to as well, because we started to see this this past weekend. You have to, particularly now with these early week games, if you're playing in full FBS formats, you have to now, excuse me, do extended research um, on weather. You guys have to actually look ahead to Saturday's weather forecast now because we're starting getting we're starting starting to get to the point of the season where that's going to matter and you may actually have to take a chance on a guy maybe on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night if you're looking like there's going to be some, you know, bad weather or terrible wind uh in the forecast depending on the position of player you're looking at. So my my point is what I'm trying to make is my po the point I'm trying to make we're getting to the point of the year where weather is starting to play a factor into some of these matchups. And you've got to be able to look at that when you're forecasting your lineup in the middle of the week. Second question coming in from Bobby Q sauce, Bobby Q sauce. You've been on it all year, man. Thanks for all the questions you send in. I mean, most of you guys that are sending questions have been sending them in every week and I appreciate it. Bobby Q sauce asks another week, another Giddens question. Did he show enough against Houston to confidently start him? The rest of the year. Here's what I'd say. Giddens has now scored a touchdown in back-to-back -to -back weeks. Where I don't 
a, where, where the question for me is a no is when you say confidently start him rest of the season. I just said a little while ago that I felt Kansas State was the best team in the Big 12 right now. We'll see how that plays out this week when they play Texas. Whether or not that translates to consistency for Giddens is a whole different question. I don't have the confidence to start him every week, but it's a risk you might have to take based on your roster, your depth, and the matchup. So do I think he's a starting option? Yes. Can I say that confidently? He's a he's a starting option every week right now. I'm not ready to go there yet. He's scored in back-to-back weeks, but he's only scored in three different weeks so far this year. And I'd love to be able to see a little bit. You know, he scores three out of four, then I feel a little bit better. I love what they've doing, what they've done the last two games, and I like his numbers the last two games. But I can't sit here and confidently say that I would start him knowing that he's going to find the end zone next week. BP Brennan asked, is Kai Robichaux a start over guys like Damian Martinez, Montreal Johnson, and Jason McClellan? I think so right now. Yes. I mean, we've had a couple of games from him back-to-back. Him um, and Thomas Castellano have been Castellanos have been a tremendous one-two punch in that Eagles backfield. Look. Robichaux went 21-165-2 and two on the road at Georgia Tech, 23-112-2 and two against Connecticut. It's either him or Castel- Castellanos right now that's carrying that offense. I do like him better than all of those names that you just r- listed there, BP Brennan. However, there's one caveat. I'll say this. I like Damian Martinez this week a lot in that Oregon State game against, against Colorado. I If you're asking for rest of the season, I can ride with that one. I can roll with that one after a couple of back-to-back weeks of that. You know, um, now I just sat here and didn't say that and said that I wouldn't confidently start Giddens after back-to-back weeks of solid performances. But there's a lot of there's a few miles to feed in that Kansas State offense. You've got Treshawn Ward. You've got two quarterbacks that can get a carry at any time. Robichaux and Castellanos are almost exclusively getting all the work in that Boston College backfield. So I do like him a lot. However, I do like that Oregon State matchup against Colorado this week. And I I, I like him, but I don't know if I would like him over a player like Damian Martinez in week 10. So there's the caveat. Bedtime 37 asks, is Acker a decent replacement if Braylon Allen's injury is long term, or would the Wisconsin backfield be one to stay away from? Well, here's the issue that I have with Acker and with Braylon Allen. If Braylon Allen were to miss two to three weeks, the time to start Acker, and here's where the risk has to be worth the reward for you. Um if you're considering starting Acker, if Allen is out the time to start, let's just assume Braylon's at Braylon Allen would be out for the next four games. Let's just assume that the Wisconsin schedule sets up like this, Indiana, Indiana, Northwestern, Nebraska at Minnesota. I actually feel based on looking at the schedule, the window of opportunity is this week and next. If Acker is going to replace Allen and you are going to start him, you are probably going to want to start him against Indiana and Northwestern. Now, with that being said, do we know that he's going to get the exclusive work in that Wisconsin backfield? And we don't. So it's a risk that you have to be willing to take based on the matchup this week. We may not get a true. And look, this is under the assumption Allen would be out three to four weeks. We may not get a true sense of what they're going to do in Allen's absence for a couple of weeks. The problem is this two weeks is the window of opportunity to get a player like Acker in because Nebraska and Minnesota would be a little bit of a tougher defense where I don't think you're really going to roll up a ton of yards in those games. So that's my thought on, on Acker to replace Braylon Allen if he's out for an extended period of time. Bedtime 37 also asks with a follow-up question. I love that coming in right after uh, another question. 
can you trust these guys in the lineup going forward? Sione Vaki and Travis Hunter. And here's what I think. I think that's a tough one too. Um, you know, Vaki has, you know, two out of three games has looked good, right? Here's the problem. They played Oregon. And when you when they with them playing Oregon, eventually they were going to have to score. They could not get that done. That offense fell behind, and all of a sudden they could not be the Utah offense that they were the past couple of weeks. As long as you feel that Utah is in a matchup in which they're going to be playing from ahead or even most of the game, and let's be honest, they're not going to play many other offenses like Oregon the rest of the way, then I think you're okay with starting Vioni, uh, Sione Vaki. But that would be the only reason why I think we're asking the, that this question this week is because of that. Now, in regards to Travis Hunter, I, I I don't have a lot of confidence in that. He's had two, look, he's played in five games offensively. He's had 11 and 13 receptions, respectfully, in two of the five matchups. In the other three games he played, he caught three passes, two passes, and three passes. Can you trust these guys in your lineup? I don't think you can. But again, I'm going to go back to what I tell you. It, 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 it's sort of like my, um, you know, it, it, you have to base your decision on the matchups and the format that you're in. It's the really thing. It, it's the one thing that's really tough about being on this side of the microphone is that I really, college fantasy football, there are so many different formats, so many deep leagues, full FBS, power fives. Um, it really does come down to matchups. Is it a risk your work? Because look, if 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 Hunter's going to get the looks that he's going to get in two of those five matchups in which he played, he's absolutely worth starting. But are you willing to risk a two-catch performance over these last three weeks of the season? When we just had a question a little earlier where a guy like Silas Bolden caught a touchdown in three of his last four, and Arizona receiver, receiver Tet McMillan has had at least six receptions in six of the last seven games. If you were to sit here and tell me that Travis Hunter was going to average six reception a game receptions per game from now to the end of the year, I'd say he'd be a must start. But when he's throwing twos and threes and twos around an 11 and 13, it makes it very difficult. You got to pick and choose your battles. And right now that Colorado offense is one dimensional and it's all going to come down to matchups for them. I don't know if Oregon state is another decent matchup for them, but they may be able to sc score a few more points this week than they were last week. But you know, Colorado, Colorado, I think right now is the team that we thought they were going to be. They caught, let's be honest. They caught TCU off guard in the first week. Um, you know, TC, you know, I, say what you want. Colorado, great job. Tip your hat. Nebraska had them played perfectly. Uh, Nebraska gave the game away on turnovers uh, with Jeff Sims, which Jeff Sims played again this past week for Nebraska and gave another six points away. Uh, you'd argue that maybe if they played Nebraska today, they wouldn't win that game. It may not even be close. Um, so I think Colorado really is, you know, it, it's going to be based on their matchups. Now, what I don't know is really just looking at their schedule. And so maybe this is a long-term answer for your Travis Hunter question. They play Oregon State this weekend, and Oregon State's decent. They play Arizona the following week, and Arizona's been playing pretty, pretty good. And then they go to Washington State and at Utah. I'm not sure Colorado has a good matchup on their schedule the rest of the way, unless you want to really consider at Washington State one because the Cougars have been very disappointing over the last few weeks. But by the time we get to November 17th, hell, it might be snowing up there in Pullman. And next thing you know, that one-dimensional offense isn't going to be able to do anything. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Colorado offense from here on out. But that's how I would that's how I would look at Vaki and Hunter. I have more confidence right now in Vaki than I would Hunter right now based on the Colorado offense and where they stand right now. Uh, Jay, Mar Jay Maracy, Mor Morris, do we cut ties on McMillan and Igbuka? Obviously, this is Jalen McMillan and um, Ameka Igbuka. Look, depending on the format, again, I don't know if you cut ties, but I don't think you could start them either, right? 
And so depending on how shallow your roster size is, you may have to let one go if you're fighting for your playoff life just to free up a roster spot to find somebody that's playing. Because how many times can you hold how many times can we hear that somebody's going to play and them not play? Right. I mean, look, when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, what's interesting is is Jalen Polk is playing so well. I don't know how you replace Jalen Polk anyway. I put this in my news and notes observation uh, notes and observations this past week. Jalen uh Jalen Polk has as many 100 yard games this year as Roma Dunsey and, and Jalen McMillan combined. Um, I don't think that. So if McMillan comes back, I don't know, is he anything better than wide receiver three now in that offense and based on the matchup, that's good enough to start, but is he going to start? Is he even going to play? Those are the questions. And I don't think you can take that chance until we actually see him on the field. And for you guys that are holding on to him, you have to, I think, particularly if you're in a spot to make a playoff run. If we see him come back this week, then that's great. Don't start him, but then you've got him back for the playoffs. So you have to be a little bit patient right now. I'd be more concerned about Egbuka than I would right now with Jalen McMillan because Egbuka, I think, even if he comes back, his upside is limited right now in that offense because that offense right now in that passing game is absolutely built around Marvin Harrison Jr., and they're not spreading it around as much as they did last year. They don't have the quarterback or the offense to do that, and Harrison is the guy. Whereas in the Washington offense, if McMillan comes back at 100%, any given week, McMillan, O'Dunsey, or Polk could be the guy. So I'd favor McMillan over Egbuka. I think you've got to hold him. Bacon Fueled asks, if you're out of the playoffs, who would be some targets you would shoot for in planning for a keeper league next year? The look, uh, Bacon Fuel, I'd love to be able to give you this the answer to uh, give you some names. This is a really tough one. It's hard. These are the questions that really get tough for me because I don't know the formats of the type of leagues. Next thing you know, I feel like I'm throwing out names and you know they're already taken. Um, because I don't know the depth of your league. The one thing that I will say, and this is why I wanted to take this question, even without having any specific names to reference. This is the biggest reason in Keeper Leagues why you have to stay tuned in to the season, why you stay tuned into these podcasts, stay tuned into the notes and observations, stay tuned into the waiver wire, because these are the weeks, 9, 10, 11, and 12, where you're starting to build your roster in Keeper Leagues for the next season. Now, it all depends on the format of your league and the rules as well, too. Because, look, I, I, I've played in leagues before that once when you become mathematically eliminated from the playoffs, then you can no longer make any more transactions through the end of the year because then the players that are available should be available to the guys that are in contention for the league title and no players should be getting dropped off of a roster that can make a difference for the teams that are still alive in the playoff run. So I'm really curious on the different, that's what I'm saying. There are so many different formats and league formats out there that I just, you know, that's hard. I would say stay into the tune into the waiver wire to get as many players as you possibly can. But I'm curious to know how many keeper leagues still allow acquisitions for teams that are still, that are no longer uh, math, mathematically alive in the playoffs, because uh, I, I'm kind of curious to know how you guys work that out, because I'm not a big fan of allowing teams to drop players um, that are not in contention and have teams that are still in contention, pick them up off the waiver wire. So um is it Jay Jaeger 74 comes in late. You got this right before I ended the podcast. So we've got some of these questions here. I'll get to Jaeger 74 comes in late with a late one. Is it okay to roll guys out against Georgia, Missouri, Ole Miss guys? He's asking, um, you know, I'd, I'd have to take a look at the matchups. I, I, I would start a Luther bird. I, I would consider starting a Luther bird and I'd be more concerned about starting a, a Cody Schrager against Georgia than I would maybe the passing game. I don't know if I would start Brady cook. I would probably take a look at one of their receivers, right? With either Weiss or burden Ole Miss. I'd probably still take a chance on, on Quinshaw Judkins. I feel like he's healthy now. He had his, you know, two touchdowns this past weekend. He's a guy that I'd probably 
you know, still consider starting against that Georgia defense, depending on what I needed out of him and how conservative or aggressive I needed to be on that weekly matchup. Jay Light asks, is uh, Gage Larvaday in a drop with Gabbert done for the year and that offense being putrid? Well, the one thing that you have to remember, Jay Light, I you know, it's interesting. I had a conversation with, with uh, Mike this past weekend, and, you know, we're sitting here on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights ready for Maction, right? Two years ago, all of these Maction games, the reason why we were excited for them, because there was no defense. We were watching 38, 35, 45, 42, you know, 41, 40 games on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night. That's not happening now. All of a sudden, for some reason, the Mac has gotten defensive. Ohio and Miami of Ohio, along with probably Toledo, maybe I'm missing one other one, they're actually playing pretty decent defense. And if if I'm going to – what I'll say is this. I actually think that that Miami of my, uh, Ohio, Ohio uh, – that Ohio defense was pretty decent, and Miami of Ohio scored some points this past week. And I think, I think Larva Dane's a hold. You know, the one thing that's interesting, I went back and checked this before last week, but when I think it was Smith that came in and relieved Gabbert, um, I want to say it was either two or three Larva, two or three of Larva Dane's receptions in that matchup the week before were actually completed to him from from Smith. So uh, there was still a connection there with those two. I just happen to think that Ohio is one of the better defenses in that conference. So for me, I would not hesitate starting him in an upcoming matchup because. Um, I still think that he's going to get targeted in that offense. And we have seen, particularly in the beginning of the year, he only needs four or five catches to get one, bring one to the house and score. He's still an option for me. I wouldn't actually um, throw the towel in, the towel on him yet. Um, your last question, start bench. I'll go ahead and catch this on the show. Start, sit, 0.5 PPR. Choose two out of Quinton Cooley versus Louisiana Tech. Terrell Vaughn versus San Diego State, Makai Hughes versus East Carolina, Harrison Whaley versus Colorado State, and uh, Hunter versus Vanderbilt, Jaquez Hunter. So I'm taking Hunter out of the conversation. Uh, you have It's half-point PPR. I'm probably going to take Vaughn out, and for me, it's coming down to Cooley, Hughes, in Whaley, I'd have to look at that matchup for Wyoming versus, versus Colorado State. But if Whaley gets his heavy workload, he's going to be a tough one to avoid. And it's hard to uh, ignore right now, Hughes and Cooley. I think you got a pleasant problem there right now, Jay Light. But those are the three guys that I would look at. Um, I think Vaughn's in the conversation, but I like the running backs just because of the volume that they get. And uh, Hunter, for me, would be a diss, and I'm scratching him out of that. But look, that takes care of all the questions in the Discord. So I hope those help. Look, here we are coming up to week 10. For everyone that's in, you know, still mathematically alive in your college fantasy football playoffs, uh, you've got to sweep the table over the next couple of weeks to, to make those uh, the top four. You've got to have a good week this week if you are trying to qualify in a format that includes a quarterfinal, maybe top six. Uh, teams top two get buys or maybe there's a, a full eight team quarterfinal but look good luck to everyone this week start paying attention to the weather and the college fantasy football playoffs are upon us the money weeks as i like to say are coming up and they really start this week because there's a lot of pl uh, teams whose season is on the brink and this is a make or break week. So good luck to everyone. We're going to try to get the projections, rankings, all the DFS writings up as soon as we can this week. But stay tuned to the, uh, to the website. And don't forget for all of you guys that are not tuned into that Discord injury channel on Saturday mornings, it's not too late. Get on in. Until next week, good luck.